Okay, with that introduction to data partitioning, let's take a look at classification techniques. I'll give a very brief introduction to the classification techniques and then we'll consider a specific classification technique. Okay, so in classification, just to recap, we are trying to see if a particular case belongs to a certain class. We're not trying to make a numerical or number prediction. Instead, we are just trying to classify the items in, as belonging to one class or another class. So it could be that you have a set of people and you want to find out who are the people who are prospective buyers and non-buyers. Or let's say you've got a credit card transaction. You want to know which transaction is fraudulent, which transaction is normal. Or you've got a game coming up. Let's say the game is going to be played tonight or tomorrow and you want to make a prediction on whether a particular team will win or lose or you're sending out credit card offers to people uh, or some offers and you want to know which are the people who are likely to accept the offer or not accept the offer or you want to make a prediction on the weather tomorrow it's going to be sunny, cloudy, rainy, etc. All of these are classification problems. So when we talk about supervised learning what we're really saying is we've got some data and we have partitioned the data into training and validation partitions. Okay, usually the training partition will be larger, validation partition would be somewhat smaller. So you've classified, uh, you've broken down, partitioned the data. Now you're going to use the training partition to build a model or you're going to use the validation partition to see how good the model really is. Okay, uh, of course we don't want to uh, evaluate the model on the same data that we used to build the model. Okay, just like I said in the last class, it's like studying for a test using certain set of questions, 100 questions, and then testing yourself to see how good you are based on those same 100 questions which you studied. That's not going to be a realistic test of where you stand. You need a set of independent questions to see whether you really understood what you studied. In the same way, we build the model on a training partition, but we put aside some data uh, completely. We don't use that in training at all, and then we test the model on that validation partition which we kept aside okay so in the training partition we've got a lot of data we and we also have the classification of whether the person is a owner or non-owner and our goal is to try to predict who is likely to buy uh, a luxury car let's say okay so we build the model whatever classification model we'll discuss some classification models after this we build whatever classification models we want with this and then test the model on this Okay. So in the validation partition, again, we have data about who are all the people who are owners and non-owners. We have the actual data. But then we use the model and also predict for each case whether, they were, uh, whether the model predicts them to be owners or non-owners. Okay. So now we can compare the actual information with the model prediction. And then based on that, we can, we can compare these values and based on that we can come to a conclusion as to how good the model is okay so that's the idea okay so for example in our validation data let's say the model predicted like this first person was an actual non-owner the model predicted it right second one was an owner but the model said non-owner so that's wrong the third and fourth the model got correct okay so the quality of the model is really how close are the model predictions to the actual values okay so we look at model quality so suppose we had a larger data set not the one we showed and it turned out that there were actually 250 owners in the validation partition out of those 200 of them the model classified correctly okay so so this is actual so out of the actual owners 200 of them were classified as owners 50 of them were classified as non-owners okay so what you have here is a total of 250 owners and a total of 150 non-owners okay so out of the 150 non-owners the model got 100 of them correct right it classified actual non-owner as a non-owner and it got 50 of them wrong an actual non-owner was classified as an owner okay this as you might recall from your earlier course is what is called as an error matrix or a classification confusion matrix and this matrix is useful to verify the quality 
of the model. So in this case, the model got 300. That is, it got these 200 are correct and these 100 are correct. Okay. So these represent the correct values, correct predictions by the model. So it got 300 right and it got 100 wrong. Okay. The values along this diagonal are the ones which are wrong. Non-owners classified as owners and owners classified as non-owners. Those were wrong. Okay. So out of the 400 cases, the model got 300 cases correct, which is a 75% correctness performance or a 25% error rate. Okay. So we can use this to see how good the model is. Okay. So we can go by overall correctness percentage, which is 300 out of 400, 75%, or we might be interested in how many of the owners the model gets correct and how many of the non-owners the model gets correct. Okay. That's another way of looking at it. Sometimes you are more sensitive to errors in a particular category. For example, suppose uh, you are able to predict somebody as an owner or a likely owner, right? And if you get that correct, then the person will come to your shop and buy a product and you'll get a profit of, let's say, 10,000 rupees per uh, person who turns up, right? Whereas, suppose you invite a non-owner, you might spend, let's say, 50 rupees to send an invitation to that person, right? And let's say uh, you predict that person as an owner, then the person is going to come to the store and we're going to incur expenses. Whereas, suppose who's an actual owner and the uh, pro and our model predicts them to be non-owners, then what's going to happen is somebody who is likely to have given us a profit of, you know, 10,000 rupees, we have classified them as a non-owner and we lost that money completely. So, in other words, the gain from predicting an owner correctly, let's say, is much higher than the loss from uh, you know, predicting a non-owner incorrectly as an owner, right? In that case, you would prefer to make a mistake of classifying a non-owner as an owner rather than classifying an owner as a non-owner, right? Because we tend to lose a lot of money in the process, okay? So, in other words, what I'm trying to say here is it is possible that not all mistakes are of equal importance. Some mistakes may be much more costly than other mistakes, Okay. So, that is why we might be interested in the percentages, not just the overall percentages. right? We might be more sensitive to percentages of owners and non-owners. So, if you look at the percentage of owners that the model got correct, it got 200 out of 250 correct. Okay, The total is 250 and it got 200 of them correct. So, that is a correctness rate of 80%. And for non-owners, the model got 100 out of 150 correct which is about 67 percent okay so it depends which one you choose depends on your actual situation so these are all uh, measures of model quality okay let's see how to generate error matrices uh, matrices or classification confusion matrices in r okay so we read the data file we read the data file and this data file is called class collegepref.csv. I have loaded it on uh, on the course web uh, under session 3. You can take a look at it. So, um, first of all, what we want to do just to make sure that the values display in the correct order, we want to say, uh, you know, the uh, there is a field called perf, which is performance and that has values low, medium and high. It's a factor. Okay. Now, by default, when you don't specify the ordering of the levels, uh, R is simply going to go by alphabetical order, right? So it will become high, low, medium. That will be the order by alphabetic H I J K L M. Okay, that's the order it's going to be. But we want to say no, no, no. The correct ordering is low, medium, high. So we are going to say C P dollar pref, which is you know per perf, is ordered C P dollar perf levels equals low, medium, high. So now we are saying low is the lowest, medium is slightly higher, high is the highest. We are giving the order. Okay. Now this table, this data has two columns called perf, which is the actual performance of students and pred, which is the predicted performance of students by some model. Okay. So here we have not yet actually discussed classification models, but we are assuming that there is a data file in which we've got the actual values and some models predictions. Okay, we'll come to the actual models shortly, right? But once you have that, how do you generate the error matrix? Okay, the way to generate the error matrix is very easy. We can use the table 
function in R. Okay, this is this function is available in the base package. You don't really need to install any other package for this. Okay, so we are saying tabulate the values of CP dollar perf, which is the array of actual performance vector of actual performances. Tabulate that with CP dollar pred, which is a vector of predicted performances. Okay. And then we just want to have proper column headings. So we just say DNN, okay, which is the just the names to put on the two columns, actual and predicted. It's a vector consisting of the values actual. So the result of that might look something like this. So we are, so the actual and predicted, they came here because we put the DNN. If we don't put DNN, then you're not going to see these two things, actual and predicted. So you might be wondering, what is it showing? Okay, so here the error matrix tells us that of the uh, low performances, 1150 of the actual low performers were predicted correctly by the model as low performances. 84 of the low performers were actually predicted to perform medium and 98 of the low performers were predicted to perform high. Okay, so this total would be these and we can then see the proportions. Okay, so the correct predictions are those in the diagonal. Okay, 1801 of mediums, actual mediums were predicted to be mediums and 458 of actual high were predicted to be high. Okay, so once again we can calculate the overall correctness rate for the model and then correctness rate for each individual category as well. Okay, so that is how you do error matrix in R. Okay, now of course we were talking about overall percentage and so on. It's You can easily generate percentages in matrix uh, in in R okay so here notice that we created the results and stored them in a variable called tab okay so we created the error matrix here in the table command and we stored the resulting table in a variable called tab okay that contains these uh, this value this result is what that variable tab contains Okay. Now you may want to see proportions instead of raw numbers. It's very easy to do that. Just say prop dot table, and then you pass the resulting generated table to it. Right? You're passing the table that we generated in the previous uh, slide as the argument, and then it gives you the proportions. These are overall proportions. Okay. These are overall proportions. Meaning, if you take all the numbers and add them up, you'll get one. Okay. But you may say, uh, first of all, there's a problem with this in the sense that it's showing more than it's showing too many decimal places. Looks like it's more than we can absorb. So you may want to reduce the number of decimal places. Uh, so you can do that by setting options digits equals two. Okay. So that says, give me two digits two non-zero digits in the result right and then if we do prop dot table tab it gives the results okay so now we see that there's one decimal place less you may wonder if I said digits equals two why is it giving me four decimal places it's doing that because there are numbers here with two leading zeros right so it's giving us two non-zero digits so because the smallest number requires us to use four digits it's giving us four digits for all the numbers Okay, so the two that you give is only a suggestion, and it's going to give you two if all the numbers had, uh, you know, at least uh, two non-zero beginning digits. Then we would have got only two digits, but that's not the case. But this is useful in general. Sometimes you know, uh, R prints seven digits and eight digits, so then you can control it by using option digits equals two. Okay, so after you execute the command option digits equals two, subsequently till you change it, it's going to try and it'll keep this setting. Okay. Now, sometimes, just like we said, we may want the proportions only across the rows or across the columns. Okay. In the previous slide, we saw the proportions were across the entire table. All the numbers added up to one. Now, we may want to say, well, what percentage of low performers does the model predict correctly as low, etc. Okay. You may want row-wise percentages, in which case you do prop dot table tab comma one and then it will give you row to row wise percentages. Now if you add up all the elements in a row, you will get one. Each row will add up to one. And if you want column wise percentages, you do comma two. Now each column will sum up to one. 